extraordinary specificity. Um, the issues that would normally arise in the study of material culture, about whether they constrain, whether there are affordances, how their culture would be transformed in particular contexts, etc., would be just as true for these objects as for kind of the objects of the past. Um, and the objects that were downstairs would once have been the Facebook, in other words, you know, Zig, the first person who had Zig, the mm -hmm. first person who bought in the plastic. Um, these would have been seen in, the, in those days as the kind of revolutionary shunned to the paradigms of study that we previously had. Now they're, you know, as it were, the detritus and the debris that we regard as sunken into um, the sort of now maintained objects against which we now have the interior and the gimmicky and the digital, etc. Um, but in many respects, I think the challenge is to retain the lessons that have been learned from anthropological approaches um, that now I think have proven their worth, and which one of the most important um, is to force ourselves to focus on quotidian, unseen, unremarked, and normally unsmiled objects that are, as you put it, the infrastructure um, to how we live our lives, the sort of you know, audio kind of underlying practical taxonomies that actually are often responsible for socializing us into being the cultural beings that we are. These objects did it, these new objects did it, and I think we have to retain that strength of anthropology um, in addressing stuff that nobody else really wants to address. So, do we open the door? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I just wanted to, to, to continue with that point. Um, actually, in design anthropology, the research question comes to how do we become humans, not through objects, but through artifacts. I think the change of the work, like from objects to artifacts, brings a lot of more open-endedness to whatever like that artifact can bring. So I think it also comes from where the question is framed. Like, it's from anthropological theory, or it's from a sub discipline from anthropological theory, and also like what um, I don't know, what context are you giving to the object? Does it have uh, affordances and interactions that come within, or is just like a symbolic artifact that's just there? So I think like actually words do matter for me at least. Um, I don't know what do you think about that. If like the distinction of objects or an artifact is maybe irrelevant or it is relevant. I, I don't care how it's used in design anthropology. How is artifact used? So for example, um, so the research question from that area, so actually like, you know, design doesn't have a real like big framework to understand um, design. Design as a discipline, it has always been a crack. So when it hooks up to um, design, uh, to anthropological theory, it's, it mainly is how do we become humans through artifacts, through these material things that can be more complex than just an object. And it could be a system like, for example, Facebook, can be like uh, um, a, a space, can be like actually something much bigger than what we can understand um, by the word object. So maybe like my interaction with money or stuff like that, which is way more complex when it's but an artifact. It's it's very different to what an object is. Um, I guess I would assume that to be part of anthropological analysis, it is the artifactual quality um, that we tend to stress um, in the way the transformation in the semantics comes with the terrain of anthropology. But I think that um, situating that specifically with the design anthropology is interesting. And um, where I'm working, we've just started a new MA program about materials and design. Um, and that is starting to sort of focus on where does design itself fit into these kind of processes. And I think that one of the things that tends to be stressed is that um, other disciplines, we tend to start with design as a kind of sort of pseudonymous creativity. Somebody comes along and they think, they conceive of a possibility, and then they try and realize that. Whereas uh, design anthropology, um, I think, is something that would be you know, situated in that much wider context of material culture, and particularly in the sense to use your own terminology, the sense that this was always what made us human. 
so that it's recognising that design is actually much more part of a cycle where um, the, 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 the artefacts that come to us historically then get become the context by which people think about the ways that might be further transformed, sometimes with, you know, the, with the intentionality of design. These then become the objects which in turn kind of cycle back. Um, and so instead of having a kind of unilinear idea of what design itself is, um, this sense of humanity is a much more kind of circular process in that kind of Bourdieu sense and becomes how you situate the whole process of design itself. And I think that the word artifact, I hope, will speak to that. I mean, just thinking about my own kind of intellectual genealogy, I did, there was a, a point where, for me, it was very liberating to forget about artifacts and to just think about objects. Because artifact carried with it all of this kind of social stuff. And that's fine, but I was wanting to not, not simply you know, do yet another kind of social construction, but, but to think much more deeply about, you know, the kind of object quality of objects in themselves somehow. What are the what are the, the kind of durable, you know, almost transcendent qualities of things that do stuff and have their own force, not to say agency necessarily, regardless of what, whatever any human mediation would bring to it. And for me, for some of the work on money, that was very, 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 very liberating. Right? So to really think about something like a uh, like futures, say, and to then say, oh, wait a minute, the future isn't really this abstract thing. It's just a contract. And the contract isn't just the, the congealing of a bunch of social agreements and social relations and economic relations. At the end of the day, it's a piece of paper or you know, a digital screen. And there's something about the, just the mere facticity of it as an object, not an artifact, that allows for the kinds of movements that then get going in the world of finance. So really getting down to that, that level of objectness, not artifactness, allows me to ask certain questions like, what is it about you know, the physical material form of a contract that gives it the power that it has to then animate other worlds? But then, you know, but, but it's not it's not like sort of one or the other, right? That makes me want to come back out of that and get into the artifactual qualities of the thing. So maybe you can interchange the value on the research question. Absolutely. I mean, I, I always think of these things as, you know, um, alternatives, but alternatives in the sense of uh, like alternating current, you know, that goes up and down as a process in time, um, or a, a phase shift. I mean, for me, this is very easy to envision because I'm completely blind, and I can just sort of think like, OK, there's this world, and then there's that world, right? And they're both there, especially if I do this. But, but I want to have them both going back and forth in time to get at the thing. That doesn't work for people who have you know, eyesight. I have that. It's a confusing thing to get. We're good at that. Assembling things, for instance, uh, people in, in their homes, people who who wait till rodamiento, como podría ser, como suelta, and like uh, metal things that you, that you use for construction. So the screws, and, screws yeah. yeah. So the work of the woman, for instance, is to they, they, she has a bag full of these things, and she has to wait it and classi classify in the different uh, sizes. Or uh, another group of women, they, they assemble uh, in two things. Flax. Flax. <laughs> okay. So uh, they are relating to pieces, which are not ruins, mm -hmm. because they are going to be something else after it. So, uh, but, but even as pieces, they are, they are already objects. So, uh, how, how do you think that the, 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 the relationship to, to that kind of uh, fragmented world uh, can, can be, uh, if you really want to, to think in, in, 
that objects can, can give you a mean, meaning to your, to your a work or to your, uh, what you are doing. Uh, uh, it's, it's a different thing, to, it's a different relationship to the ruin. It's, I, I, I mean, this is, don't think it's exactly what you're asking, but what, like I say, is what comes into my head. And um, what's coming into my head is actually the floods in Thailand, and I'll explain why. Um, because on the one hand, I think we, all of us, these screws, um, what I first associate them with is, is places like IKEA furniture, uh, where you know exactly, it comes back to you as, a, as a, the self assemblage. So it's, it has all these kind of phases where things are fragmented apart, in this case, in this flag system, the pulling out system of labor, which actually is a very important system of labor in the development of the industrial revolution, if that's about our ambition. Um, and then, you know, you're supposed to put like anything. I was thinking if one screw goes wrong, um, you don't get your kind of bookcase and the thing doesn't actually work. And you don't think the screw is very important, but then actively um, you have to go all the way back to et cetera and get the screw again. Now, the reason I think that becomes interesting is um, that we're familiar with in everyday life when we're putting assembling some furniture in the the store. But what is not visible to us? is the, um, the, the way in which modern manufacture is spread out into these extraordinary, not just domestic, if you like, transnational uh, units. And it's only when you get something like an earth, uh, a tsunami in Japan, and recently the floods in Thailand, that you suddenly find all the, the bits of the chips that were being made in Thailand um, have to be essential to making, I don't know, motherboard somewhere else, then perform part of the community. And huge kind of industries fall apart. So just like we domestically, without the screw, can't make the bookcase, it seems like the political economy, without that particular screw, the one that was disrupted by the Thai flood, can't make world global manufacture. And um, I think that, I mean, what like I said, it wasn't even answer your question, but it certainly it speaks to the sensibility, which I think anthropologists actually need to have a lot more, which is this kind of globalization that builds on top around uh, contemporary political economy, which in the end comes back to where are the people making the screws? If something happens to them, what else is going to fall apart? Yeah, I, I'm more interested in, in what's happening to them, because they, they don't see the big picture that you are telling us. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know if this screw is going to go for a furniture or for something else. Yeah. So my question is, is that, like, what's the, the meaning or what's the importance for them to be dealing with this uh, hundred of screws every day uh, which are part of their daily life because they are all around their homes. Uh, it's weird. Like, it's, 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 weird. it's weird too because in, in a sense they have access to a level of grammar that I certainly don't, right? Because mm -hmm. they probably know, oh, all the screws come in these various lengths and weights, mm -hmm. which I don't know at all, but like a mechanic probably would or an architect or you know, someone who goes to the the store where you buy all those sorts mm -hmm. of hardware would know that. But to me, um, such things are always a revelation when you realize that there are languages there of these objects, that there's a grammar, mm -hmm. um, that there is that there is structure to mm -hmm. that thing. And it's always to, you know, as someone who is terrible at handiwork, mm -hmm. um, it's always kind of magical. Like when someone pulls you aside and says, like this happened to me, someone once pulled me aside and said, look, if you turn it this way, no matter what it is, it goes off. <laughs> this way, no matter what it is, it goes off. And you're like, wow, there's like this kind of global standard that we're talking about. And what's so interesting to me then, too, are once you learn bits of those grammars, then you're always caught off guard when they're wrong, when you encounter a thing that doesn't work that way, it doesn't have those affordances that isn't participating in, in the grammar. So one could, I mean, I don't this isn't sort of speaking necessarily to the people that you're working with, you could think about what is it that they have access to mm -hmm. that other people don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they encounter a world that doesn't work, mm -hmm. what's their relation to it? Mm -hmm. um, and what are the ways, you know, what one project would be to reflect on the creation of standards in, you know, building fasteners. Mm -hmm. um, but another would be to reflect on all of the ways in which people work around all the time those standards to get whatever they want to get done, done. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, again, you see that in the art downstairs. Mm -hmm. um, 
in the way that you know some of these objects represent the cobbling together of things from different technological systems, presumably to make something work, uh, given what you've got. So I don't know, it's just, just a, a little kind of you know, uh, experiment one can play uh, around this, this sort of material where you ask, what is that grammar? Uh, how do these people engage in that grammar? And then when they encounter things not going the way they're supposed to go, they because there is, the really, to, to me, who is inept in these things, there really is a magic to all that stuff, to hardware, you know, and to its near universality. And how, how you, like, I, I, like how, how you follow the standard, and yeah. how, what you do with the standard, because it's not just for this, and it's not just the way the work that you are describing and the topic that at the same time is more, I don't know, say like global or, or it, it's part of the standard that is used in all the different uh, machines in who knows where. Uh, and then how, how would you, which is also the question about also the mobile phones, things, how, how do you go from the use of the mobile phone to the transaction and then to what, where is, where, how, how do you continue? I don't I don't really understand but of course these things are not just virtual are open and we use them and we wrap our phones and things and we it's very important the color of the phone is very important the material of it. Okay, but at the same time such things is it goes to it transport is it's a transaction, it produces transaction, it produces a standard, it goes to so how do you follow that? How do you go the way there? Look how do you follow the, those standards, but then also how do you follow the things that get accreted or layered onto onto those standards that maybe have nothing to do with with what's at the root of it at all. I mean, so just to take the mobile phone example and the some of the work that that, that Jose is talking about um, on the use of the mobile phone for sending money transfers, um, a lot of the initial services that exist in the world right now layer the transaction data on top of the text message, right, on top of <coughs> SNS. Mm -hmm. um, and that in itself locks in a certain model of how the money transfer can work. Since it's layered on an SMS text message, it's got to run through the SIM card, because that's where SMSs happen. They happen on your SIM card. Because it's happening on the SIM card, it ties you into one carrier, because the SIM is also hardwired to a carrier. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the phone, not really in the phone, but in the kind of mobile network apparatus that includes the phone, the tower, and the servers, um, there's another level of communications technology that's called USSD, which is just another thing. You don't need to know what it's for. Um, it initially was designed simply to tell the towers where your phone is. So when you're moving from cell to cell, the phone sends out a little signal over this other, uh, other channel called USSD to say to the tower, I'm here, and the tower says, OK, I see you. That has to be, by definition, independent of the carrier. That can't be tied to the carrier, because I might be moving into a you know, movie star cell, um, and I've got a T-Mobile phone, right? So it can't has to be independent of the carrier. Well, if you ride transactional data on that, say, for example, or data about money, then you have a, ser a service that is carrier independent that the telecommunication companies would have a hard time getting, getting control over. Um, all of these are kind of unexpected affordances or unintended affordances of technological standards and technological systems um, that folks can discover along the way or make use of and patch together. But I think, you know, more often than not, a lot of our so-called systems are these kind of workarounds or, or patch jobs of you know, taking things and sticking them together and it works. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, it works, just move it on. <laughs> Let's not screw it up. And you know, again, that's something that I thought was really quite compelling about some of the, the objects downstairs is they they they, they carry that sense of uh, a working a set of working relationships and a working environment, even though we've got a pulley from one place, a couple of other things on the stands, a gas tanker, and a toolbox.
two golden marks on the execution day to get a vote on because um, the object when you select it as a whole, it's the same can um, the, 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 the detritus are bits within the structure of um, small scale industrial work that we normally pay the firm about to, as long as it works, and they're coming in with absolutely repair jobs, etc. They don't. And um, it, it speaks to the degree to which we cannot regard these things as like immaterial people because actually they have very specific forms of materiality um, that we become aware of only really at the point where they stop speaking to each other, or they suddenly kind of dis get disrupted, and then suddenly we have to go through the kind of intestines of the beast and find there's actually something going on there that we have never heard of, that you just elaborated. Um, and normally, um, it's only really our ignorance of these things that allows us to have this kind of discourse of immaterial, etc. But actually, um, at that moment when things are not working right, suddenly we're having to delve down and find out what actually was going on there. And it's often these kind of unmarked objects of infrastructure that you actually have as their story. Uh, speaking about that, I remember uh, I read a book written by Jim Bennett. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he yeah, had a very, yeah. Yeah, a very good example of a uh, great uh, electricity hack in the States that uh, turned off, I don't know how many states, yeah. but then all the people uh, realized the importance of electricity and uh, what happens when, I don't know, I don't remember well how it yeah. function, but it seems that electrons went to the wrong way. Right. So suddenly the complete half of the country was it's turned off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's essentially in this moment. I mean, this is so so important for the times, right? Because um, I think that people are more and more having to kind of think about the sort of the underlying infrastructures that include the, the boring screws and the little tiny things that everyone thinks about as um, you know public funding for lots of things goes away as private infrastructures, uh, as the companies that own private infrastructures go bankrupt or get reorganized, and then you're like, oh, we need to think about these things. Just one little small example from my university. Um, when the first wave of budget cuts hit about three years ago, in one unit on campus, I will, I will not name the unit, but in one unit on campus, they're like, all right, we're spending this much money on the phones, um, nobody uses phones anymore. Anybody was just rip out the phones. So they turned off all the faculty phones. Okay. In my unit, in some sciences, we did not. We kept the phones going. We did a bit just as we thought about other things we cut. Turns out that in the internal building system of the university, which had been set up like in the late 70s, early 80s, the money that the units were paying for phone service, almost all of it got recycled and re back again to cover computer networking. Okay. So in this other unit, we turned off the phones and they thought, that's great, we've saved a lot of money. But then an automatic billing thing kicked in. <laughs> and in their next cycle, they saw all of these charges for networking. Right? So this is an old, old, old system that someone thought up you know, 20 years ago that had been dormant because everybody was using the phone and the phone money that they were paying to subsidize and networking, all of a sudden got turned on again. And then people were like, oh, what are we doing now? And it's this sort of, you know, I think a lot about these dormancies, these things that are kind of latent um, in the working of things that, that kind of come alive again as stuff falls apart or gets turned off or as, you know, the money goes away from something that it was once supported. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, our libraries, many of our libraries are now um, going toward digital collections, which on the one hand is great, on the other hand, now everybody is rediscovering um, uh, copyright or now journal content, because if you're going to pay for a digital, if your library is paying for a digital edition of the journal, it's not really paying for the journal, it's paying for the right specific content. Whereas before, if it bought the physical item, it owned the physical item. It doesn't own anything anymore, it's leasing it. So which again it's like it's like, oh wait, yeah, leasing. I forgot about leasing. <laughs> these, these other other forms of economic relationships come into play that, that we thought weren't important or went away. And this 
to see if something I'll talk about um, tomorrow as well, the, the kind of rising importance of things like fees um, and rents in a world that we think is structured like paying credit. Yeah, I think I mean, because anthropologists often do field work in places that don't have the sophistication of infrastructure that you might have in Chile or you might have in, in the States, um, you, you, one of the ways this kind of comes at you is you start working in a society where there is a whole culture of repair and knowledge that we simply don't have. Um, and we, we simply take these things for granted and then we hope that there is some other expert called the repairer. Michael Christian has quite interesting work recently on, on the notion of repair itself um, as the point of expertise that you can then call on. But in many other places where the infrastructure levels are much lower, um, actually, there is a much more wide, I mean, just coming out of Trinidad from three days ago, and I'm visiting my total ignorance of basically cars and how they operate, etc., was incomprehensible to them. You know, that, that I, I could so kind of almost arrogantly take the vehicle for granted when actually um, everybody there really needs to know all the little aspects of engine work and sort of wiring, etc. Because they are constantly called upon, um, things break down, and they, they, they can't lose this knowledge. Um, and I think that, that, that if you go out to the field, um, you suddenly see the differentiation between our kind of floating up um, in, in you know, sort of um, uh, and the discipline we have achieved from the everyday uh, underworkings and the kind of things that we take for granted. When you work in another society, everybody has to know stuff. Um, all the household things consistently break down, the cars break down, um, the, and, and people taking new technologies, like the digital technologies, and they can take cell phone apart. Uh, I can't remember the faintest idea what goes on inside a cell phone. Um, but when I'm doing it out somewhere, I know that the my cell phone so buying a new one, as it were, there is somebody there who actually can, you know, take the little equivalent model, et etc., repair it, solder it, etc., etc., and work it over again.
you've got a, you're in a very good time and place um, to be thinking about um, you know, the, the taking for granted for something in the nursery. Mm -hmm. yeah, perhaps we are running out of time now. Too close, we can ask Sonia to say that word. Also, your work and your resident. Long, long strikes. <laughs> because of that, I haven't been able to produce in the process. <laughs> no, I just, I was thinking, as an artist, I feel, I have felt this agency of the objects. After making this work, I think I have a, a different connection with the work, that, with the artwork that I had before. I mean that now I, I can have a kind of, um, it's not meeting, it's more, I feel some energy <laughs> in the making because I took the pictures of the objects, then I really uh, revealed them. But also I found other objects, the, the ones that are real. And I started uh, founding connections, more like echoes between them. So, and then echoes between everything. So I'm thinking, what is the kind of energy you have or you have with the objects you, you study? For example, what is this energy you feel from your particular object? Say, I now know 
why half the world, every given day, wears blue jeans. And um, this came through ethnography, it came through um, analysis, it came through trying to set up a whole series of different projects, writing it about, and thinking, and using the theoretical and analytical tools of anthropology, and bringing this all to bear on the mystery, and actually feeling at the end of the day, yes, actually, we could do that. Feeling that for the first time, we could actually give a proper explanation, which would sort of, um, the people actually could hear, and were persuaded by, would have told you why this actually extraordinary thing happens. Um, because the point about the we, the, the, the looking again, for all our work speaks to, forcing the kind of I um, against what I tend to call the blinding the obvious. The blinding the obvious being things that are so obvious that we are blind to them. This is precisely what I think the obvious down to that speak to. Um, and actually opening the I and saying, no, what the hell is that? Why do we? Why cost? Why so many people? Um, at this particular point in time. Um, and I think that is that detective evidence has actually pretty energetic. I find it really quite exciting. <laughs> um, and I'm always looking essentially for things where I go, so I say, what the hell do we do that? And see if we can't actually find out. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Very That's a perfect uh, mission. Finish and we'll continue with that drink for something like that. Thank you very much to all of you. Congratulations. Thank you.